E-Cancer Television is here with the Blood Cancer Conference, Blood Cancers in the Elderly here in Rome. Antonello Pinto, you've just been chairing a, a session on advocacy, but before that, I want to ask you about your own subject, MDS, um, because uh, MDS is a disease of old age. What do you consider are emerging as the, the changes in therapy or changes in approaches to MDS, especially considering that populations are, are in fact getting older and, and this, this disease is more significant. Myelin's plastic syndrome is the typically uh, is a disease typically occurring in the aged people because the median age incidence is around 72 to 75 years. So it's the kind of situation which typically applies to the elderly. Uh, up to a few years ago, we, I mean, no active treatments were available, and so that was really a problem. And most of those patients were either treated with intensive chemotherapy, like AML patients, but not a great number of those patients was able to stand this very intensive treatment, or these patients were offered supportive therapy and that's it. Now, the, the scenario has changed because a number of very active agents um, are available, and for example, the typical example of this is the use of DNA hypomethylating agents, uh, which being able to modify the gene expression profile of tumor cells are able first to resolve the cytopenia, so to improve the bone marrow function even without clearing off all the tumor cells from the marrow, like one would expect in acute leukemia. And then by improving the cytopenia, these agents were shown to be able as well to improve the overall survival. Do you consider then that because of these therapies and the fact that patients are responding even when they're older, that there are now new ways of treating older people? Yeah, that's true. And uh, one of the problems we have with these agents is that we need to keep on the patients on treatment as long as possible because the effects are late. The beneficial effects to come very late upon the treatment. So it's important to continue and it's important to have the support of the family and of the patient to accept a prolonged treatment. And what sort of criteria do you look for for response then? Because you may not get a complete this response. Is, this is a very critical point because up to a few years ago, even in treating MDS, like in acute myeloid leukemia, the idea was to evaluate as effective a treatment that was able to completely clear off the marrow from tumor cells and to restore the normal marrow appearance. Uh, emerging data clearly show that if one treats patients with agents such as DNA hypermethylating agents, you don't probably need to have the complete remission picture in the marrow to improve survival of these patients. So even a partial response and even an improvement in the hemogram, a significant improvement in the hemogram, translates into an improved survival, which was something going against the typical dogma of acute myeloid leukemia. So it has been really impressive new. So in everyday practice, how do you advise a clinician to approach this? What exactly should he or she do? I, think that, I mean, communication, and this is an important issue, um, with the patient should address specifically the fact that to uh, obtain the clinical benefit with this kind of diseases, time is needed. And so patient ex expectation, you know, should comply to the idea that they will see the results over a longer time. So you ask the patient what's happening? Uh, yes, and actually it's the reverse. The patient uh, usually asks us, what do you think is going to happen? And what we usually do with this patient is to make clear that our primary end point is to restore the marrow function. We usually tell to the patient that the aim of this treatment is to have your marrow to work as it was before, and it takes time. Now, if you're not getting a complete response, what sort of tests can you make, and, and how do you, in fact, manage the disease to keep it at the sort of one, low level? That yes, you're one, about? Problem, one problem we have that is difficult to ask to an aged individual to repeat a number of bone marrow biopsies, which are disturbing, not painful actually, but surely disturbing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, match, we can rely on the hemogram. And so it's important to ask to the patient to follow quite strictly the hemogram prescriptions. 
uh, because through there, both the physician and the patient may realize how the blood levels are changing because the target is to improve the blood cell levels independently from the fact that the marrow changes or not. This is a little bit of, uh, how to say, it's a different view. So there are some measurements, but also you need to keep a lookout clinically for what's happening. Yeah, of course, of course. And then do what? Uh, I mean, we try to, I mean, after the first uh, evaluation, we try to delay a little bit the clinical checkouts because we don't want all this patient to come in and out, you know, from the clinics. It will also depend on the age. So a good way would be to advise the patient to send us the results of the blood tests. And if they are, if there is no clinical problems, we can try to be a little bit more intense in, in controls and checkout. So you can and adjust the to, dose. Yeah, and we can adjust the dose. Right. In now, interestingly enough, there's a bit of a lack of data in myelodysplastic syndrome simply because it affects older patients, and older patients traditionally have not been in randomised trials. Uh, now, one of the reasons rather overlaps with the session that you've just come out of on patient advocacy, and that's about compliance. And I think there's a prejudice against older patients simply because they often don't comply, and so the doctors yeah. don't know what's happening. Uh, we have two issues here. The, 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 the first one is that, as you said, <clears throat> there is the tendency not to include aged patients in clinical trials. This is for several reasons. This is not a, a, a recent issue. It's from years that investigators which actually work into clinical trials try to force their colleague to accrue the patient into those trials. Uh, in the patient advocacy session, we have been discussing the issue and unfortunately, still there's the tendency from many physicians not to consider an aged patient for a clinical trial, even though the eligibility criteria will allow its inclusion, simply because of misconceptions about this. And this creates, you know, discrimination. But another problem is that treatments may be protracted, especially in the case of diseases like MDS. That's true, and the problem is that the more modern treatments which are mainly targeted at changing the biology of the disease, do need prolonged time of administration. Most of those therapies can be given uh, as tablets or sub-Q injections, and you need the patient to continue treatment for months. So a problem came out with elderly people. Uh, a good idea would be to try to, uh, to put the family into the system, because we sometimes really need help of the family to remember the patient to take his tablets every day. One of the problem emerging from data analysis is that uh, elderly patients tend to be less adherent to protocol administration of drugs. That's because they may sometimes forget. And so if you find out a supportive family environment, this will be very important to ensure that they take all the medications. Right, so you've got supportive family and you can have patient advocacy groups. Lots of methods and even um, tricks and technology ways of remembering to take your yeah. medicine. Uh, you have to wait a long time for your data in some of these diseases though. Yeah. So do you have a solution for that? Perhaps involve the community or the family to track the data so that we do this get would be This would be a very interesting idea, try to keep the family system and the patient into data collection and evaluation would be a good idea. Uh, in the sense that many of the clinical parameters, different from physical evaluation, of course, can be achieved by, you know, local labs and so on. So having the family to be part of the data collecting system could be a way to avoid these problems. Another very important point, which seems apparently a trivial point, but it's critical, for example, that many of the uh, um, ways in which the, the, the tablets and the medication are presented to the patient can be troublesome for an old patient. Opening a blister of tablets is very easy for, for a young patient, but can be uh, complicated for an old patient. So also the way of packaging medications would be a good way to improve treatment adherence among elderly individuals. Could I, though, get you to sum up um, what, for you, is coming out of this conference now? Uh, it's first and foremost about myelodysplastic yeah. syndrome. Um, you mentioned about compliance now, but what practical points are you taking home from this conference on blood cancer 
in the elderly that you would pass on to busy doctors? Uh, I think the most relevant information is that now we have tools to significantly improve survival of older people and life expectancy in an elderly people uh, nowadays with a myelodysplasia, but I have to say with several other types of tumor is no longer dependent by the disease itself, but it depends strictly on how the disease is treated. If you approach correctly the management of the disease, then you can save in survival times and you can prolong the life of those patients. And would you say to doctors that uh, enough new treatments, emerging treatments, are coming forward, not only for MDS, but some of the other hematologic yeah, malignancies? Myeloma is another example, CLL is another example, and so on. So I think that we should no longer consider that an elderly patient, because of a blood cell cancer tumor, uh, should necessarily have this uh, life expectancy reduced because of the tumor. So we and should try to provide him active treatment. It's great to have you with us, Antonello. Thank you for being here. Thank you here very much. On eCancer TV. Thank you.